All right, guys, we're back. Another episode of the Mets Up Podcast. We're not doing the intro again because you want to know why? Last week, great numbers. Granted, it might be because the season just started and there's actually something to give a shit about, but the boys are back ready to talk about some baseball against the Detroit Tigers. The Mets finally got their first win of the season, which I'm super happy about because if they didn't, I was going to have to drink beer through a hot dog straw, which I still might do for the banter. I think that's just good content. Maybe if you guys... Drop enough likes on this YouTube video. I'm going to say this. 200 likes on the YouTube video. I'll still do the hot dog straw with the beer. It's 2 o'clock in the morning. I did just come back from going out, so I am a little bit like James was a couple weeks ago. But we're going to have some fun. We're going to talk some baseball here. And uh, James, much better location, much better connection. I feel like I feel like we're back because you've got another random painting behind you. What's going on in Italy? What's up, everybody? Still checking in from Italy. I'm in Milan right now with my family. Sister's running a marathon on Sunday, so here's supporting. I'm in such a weird old-timey Airbnb. There's paintings everywhere. There's such weird shit in this Airbnb. I have a bunch of pictures. I, was, I need the Mets to win a game because you can't post, like, weird things in my Airbnb, part one, if the Mets are 0-6. So, like, thank God the Mets won today. I'm going to post it this afternoon because they're strange figurines and masks and pictures and all this weird, bizarre sh- shit that that's, you can only find and get away with in, like, a strange Italian Airbnb. Eighth, eighth, flat, uh, eighth stair walk up with a bunch of bags and luggages. What? Yeah, it was, it was a struggle the other day. But, like, weird china cabinets and strange desks and lamps. But, but there's a television, and we have an internet connection, so we're watching Mets baseball. And overall, it's been a very fun trip, and it's been – it's been strange for all this mess stuff to be going on where like I, I'm watching the games, but like I'm usually I'm either they have luckily one's been during the daytime, two been during the daytime, last two games. And I go, I could just watch them in the evening and the other one game one waking up early in the morning to watch, but almost a little happy to be slightly disconnected from Mets world for this last week. Yeah, it has been a good week to miss because as we know, uh, the Mets are currently one in five, right? One in five. That's the record going yes. into uh, their next series. And it was a pretty miserable start game one. Now, some positives out of game one. Sean Mania looked phenomenal. Like, he looked great. Talk about, like, the pitching has not really been the issue per se. Uh, Sean Mania looked awesome. Brett Beatty looks great. Like, there's a lot of things to take out of it. But that one really, really hurt. That was one of the ones I think that got a lot of Mets fans going because, okay, the Brewer series sucked. Whatever. Move on. We're going up against the Tigers. We know they're a better Tigers team than they have been in the past. And with a guy pitching well on the mound, you go, okay, Mets have a real shot here. But again, the offense, which has been the story of the season thus far, has just been relatively non-existent, and it was again in game one. Manai was great. I think Manai is a good lesson for Mets fans, baseball fans, that doesn't always have to look the same when a pitcher is going to pitch well. We talk a lot about in this show and like other baseball people, Twitter, the yada yada, about like having these like writhing fastball. You hear the word IVB a lot recently, the last like year plus. Where Manaya does something that's completely the opposite. His fastball just runs like so much in, on guys and into guys, especially as a lefty into the righties. So just having a fastball that's like very weird, like weird enough that's going to catch hitters off guard. He just played that so well and was so good with it. And he just he was so in control and like having a nice big lefty on the mound just breaking off these change ups and has a little his little cutters and he was like using these weird cutting fastballs high in the zone, low in the zone. He was amazing. But again, just the offense is in, in the, even winning the game. Yeah on Thursday, the fastball, the offense is still non-existent. It's terrible. It doesn't even feel like it's getting at all better anytime soon. No. And most of that's because of Nimmo and Lindor, and we'll talk about them a lot. But like the, the only positives to take from this game on Monday was the fact that, again, the pitching was great. The bullpen was great throughout. The only bullshit that happened was because of defense, I feel like. I don't even blame Michael Tonkin. We'll talk about some weird decisions that led to the bad defense. But big story this week, while Francisco Alvarez is like taking over and looking like might be the Mets' best player, which is an insane thing to think about. Brett Beatty, too. Brett Beatty, the slow dribble of confidence that keeps coming from him, defense to offense, defense to offense. You weirdly had the two hardest hit balls in the whole game on Monday. But it's just he, he, there's very much a different feeling with him in the field right now at the plate just as a baseball player. And I think that's something that we've been talking about a lot and something that everybody can feel can get behind because you can see it and it's real and it's happening. Yeah, Brett uh, talked about it apparently with Gary. They talked about it in the first game of the doubleheader. Really good quip, really good clip there. And Gary was saying that Brett this offseason said one of the things he focused on the most was his mental game. And that's something that both me and you noticed last year was, hmm, might be taking those bad plays in the field with him at the plate. And then the bad at bats back with him back into the field. Like it didn't seem like he was ever particularly comfortable to be a major leaguer. And he goes to Gary during spring training 
if I am given the third base job coming out of spring training, which of course he has been, he goes, that means I am one of the 30 best third baseman in the entire world he goes so yeah i belong here like this isn't this isn't a problem of like if i'm good enough if i have what it takes he goes at the end of the day what am i the 28th best third baseman in the entire planet in terms of playing baseball and i think that alone right there is going to be the thing that separates brett Beatty from where he was last year because we know talent wise we know physically he has all the tools to be a very good player there's no way he's just going to forget how to hit forget how to play third base but the confidence had been what's lacking and now it seems like he is at least more confident than he was in the past i'm not going to say he's francisco alvarez who's just dripping with testosterone that guy's the fucking dog i love francisco but brett Beatty hitting fifth in the lineup now like I don't really want to move him out of there. He's having great at bats, playing good defense. Everything that we could have wanted out of Brett Beatty is like slowly happening. And I think Mets fans should be really excited. Actually at fourth game two on Thursday too, just with Francisco Alvarez getting half of a day off, which was a decision that got, yeah, got, got, got a little bit lucky that that didn't come back to bite him as bad as it could have, but everything with Beatty. And you mentioned the defense offense, the offensive defense, like this is exactly the game plan that, killed him last year where he would make a bad play in the field and you go to the box and you take it with him. Then you have a bad at bat, take it back to the field, boot the ball where he's making such good plays on defense. Such good. He had, there was a play at Thursday where he charged the Spencer Torkelson swing yes. bunt. He actually didn't even get him out, but it was like a beautiful bare hand play where he broke immediately, took three steps and whizzed the sidearm throw and just bang, missing by like a half a step because it hit so slowly. He made a great diving play in the Jorge Lopez 10th inning against the line on a line drive. He's going to be going towards the line, away from the line, in on the ball, back on the ball. Play he's making, the plate where yeah, he played like, the plate was awesome. He kind of knocked it down and Keith and Ron were like, shout to Brett Beatty getting in front of that ball. If he doesn't get in front of it, he's not able to make that play. And then he threw a strike home. They threw him out at the plate, was able to limit the run, limit the damage. Like he's been able to make big plays when we need him. And granted, they're not the Pete Alonzo home runs, the Francisco Alvarez driving in two RBIs like on a, on a single hit, but he's been moving the line. He's been playing good on both sides. That's really all we can ask for from Brett Beatty right now. I'm also 99% sure he actually leads the team in RBIs. Nice. What, what All you, right. You saying? Yeah. Because game one on um, on Thursday, he had a great two out, two out little dinky single off a lefty with two strikes, which is he served it over the third baseman's head. And I was like, I don't think 2023 Brett Beatty does that. And he also had a moment to end game two where he scores the game winning run. Who was pitching? Was it Will Vest? Was it Faido still? Was it Alex Faido? I, don't, I think it might have still been Alex Faido who gave up right. the runs. Who, the Mets made look like Matt Brash. On yeah. Monday night, he, Alex Faye, the Tigers doing that great thing right now in like player development, like team development, where they've had this run of starters come to the major leagues and not be that good. But you know what they've done? They've been like, okay, you guys just be relievers now because we're a good baseball team. That's what we need you to be. So <laughs> they've just, the Marlins, where yeah, they're I, like, AJ that Puck, that you were a great reliever. What if you start again? Oh shit, you're terrible. Now what? You're giving AJ Puck too much shit for that start the other day. He really, he settled in. He looked good. He'll, he'll be, he'll be a good starter still. But like, Joey Wentz, Alex Faye, just go to the bullpen and just like be good relievers for us. Like we want you to only pitch 30 pitches at that time. So just throw gas. And Alex Faye, on Monday, he, he looked like the best reliever in baseball. He was breaking off fastballs and sliders. And I was just like, what the hell? Like Harrison Bader and Pete Alonso played with him in college and looked so stupid in their at-bats. So thank God Pete now, got the one off him on Thursday because I was just like, I, I thought you guys knew this guy. Like, why does this look so bad? But it's not hard to make Harrison Bader look like a bad hitter right now, though. That guy is yeah, bad. genuinely one of the five worst hitters in baseball that I've seen in a while. Bad. But then Beatty, when he got the, we got the shot back against him on Thursday, after the Pete home run, like emotions high, like we've tied the game, like pressure's off. But Brett Beatty works a really good walk where the umpire – called two pitches to Brett Beatty strikes. Both of them were below his knees. They were so bad. I have a screenshot on the MLB.com. Uh, I might throw it into the video so you guys can see it, but such bad pitches. And there were so many other times in the series where Brett got called for some shit strikes. Yeah. There was another There was another check swing where he barely went through the zone and oh gave him a strike God, without a so feeling. Bad. I was like, what the hell? And every time it was like he made a comment, like he said something to the umpire, but it didn't look like he was doing it like a bitchy or a whiny way. But he stayed in his at bat. And this one, he stayed in the at bat and he wound up still working the walk and coming around to score the game winning run. Where it's just like having him in the middle of the order right now, being a player that's useful, that's effective, is changing everything. And I think as this full this season has gone, JD Martinez is going to play this week. I think Sunday is the day right now. He's going to slot into four. Alvarez is going to slot into five. And I would be remiss if Brett Beatty did not slot into six because right now there's there aren't many hitters in the Mets lineup having better at bats consistently than Brett Beatty. I don't want I don't I don't want him to be hitting 
it's great. Like behind Sterling Marte or Jeff McNeil, based on the way those guys are oh. hitting either. Like especially everything that Beatty can do, will do, and should be doing. Like he he's he's producing right now is a way that I don't know anyone else in this team maybe can besides the other top guys. Yeah, in game one, I think I texted you. He like worked a walk where he took a bunch of really close pitches. Game one of the doubleheader, and I was like, great fucking at bat from Brett Beatty. I'm like, this is the kind of stuff that makes me feel good about these takes that we've now been having for like almost two years where it's like we told you guys like it was even great like wardy shout out wardy you guys know him uh, mets content creator texted me he's like look at Beatty. he's like your, your guy is starting to show it a little bit i'm like yeah i know we don't just say this stuff to shout it into the void like especially now there's no reason for us to promote propaganda we can say the truth about everything that we're talking about here and i still feel the same way about brett brady and you're starting to see it so those are some of the positives for sure. Pete had that big home run, quickest Met ever to 500 RBIs in Mets history. He seemed really proud of that. Um, I'm sure he'd like to continue on bring, breaking some of those records. But there's a lot of still bad going on with this team right now. And especially, especially on the offensive side, it seems like 90% of the time they don't really have a clue what's going on at the plate. And the two guys that feel the most locked in, I'll say three, Alonzo, Alvarez, Beatty. Everybody else kind of seems like they don't know what's going on. Marte has looked fine. I'm not going to say anything about him. He's hit the ball hard, hit and toss some hard outs. Like, he's swinging the bat. He looks healthy. But everybody else, like, Nimmo looks just lost. Francisco Lindor looks like he's a shell of himself right now. Jeff McNeil, I don't know what's going on there, but he looks like someone who's not even, like, really competing for a starting spot right now if there was someone pushing up on his heels. He's playing horrendously bad. Don't get me started on Harrison Bader. So horrible at the plate. There's just like a lot of holes right now offensively, and that's part of the reason why this team is not able to score runs is because this lineup is so disconnected right now. Yeah, there were a lot of times when Door came up, especially during the doubleheader with a man on base, because Nemo, as bad as he looks, hitting, he, the contact is poor, but I think he took he walked four or five times during the doubleheader, so at least there's he's doing the thing that we really need him to do, which is get on base. And then Lindor will come to the plate and just look at strike one, swing at strike two, swing at strike three. You're like, what the fuck are you thinking, dude? And it's like, you can't, it's hard to blame Francisco Lindor because we've seen how good he is. But then it's like, he goes through these streaks and it's like, what the actual fuck is going yeah. on and now? And now the animals on Twitter are getting some red meat and they're coming back to the top. The yeah. 10% of rabid, weird ass Mets fans are coming back where it's like, you see, I told you about this guy, which is like, it's not Lindor. true, but it's also like, yeah. The other thing is like, I was having a conversation with my cousin Mets group chat. And because I would say that, Watching Pete at bat in, at bat out, I would still say he's struggling as well. But the difference with a guy like Pete and a guy like Francisco Lindor is that when Pete's struggling, he can do what he did on Thursday and still basically accidentally win you a game. Swing the bad pitch, three quarters swing, get the bat on it, and hit 150 miles an hour for a home run, like just accidentally. Whereas if Lindor is not in the zone right now, or like even worse, way out of the zone, the zone is not even in his periphery. Like just he can't really do anything at the plate to help you win because that lefty swing is so loopy and so long, so bad right now. He had a fastball in the inner half, and one, I think a second to last at bat on game two. And it, it, he hit a, a fastball middle in, lefty. He hit a cue shot past the past the, the third base and fouled down, fouled down the line. I was like, how did you even do that? Yeah. And the pop-ups on high and inside pitches, and he's just laid on everything. And he looks like he changed his swing a little bit. He's like more upright, and he's like a little more closed. And it's like, why'd you, why'd you change anything? Like you were doing so good. And I don't know. Now we're going on like three straight Aprils over Francisco Lindor just can't really hit. So maybe it's an April thing. Maybe it's he had a bad spring training too, like a really bad spring training where bad, he didn't. Yeah. I don't know. I'm I'm not like worried about Francisco Lindor, but I just I just want him to hit well because this Mets team won't play well if he doesn't hit well, especially him and Brand Nimmo. Like and you, those are your top two hitters. They need to get on base. They need to be like moving around the bases. If those two aren't hitting, it's very hard for the team to score runs as we're seeing. We talked about how top heaviest lineup was all off season, but we were okay with it because one two three was that good. If one and two suck, it's not that good. It's really no. bad, actually. It's terrible. And then it's getting compounded by the fact that there are some weird things happening with Carlos Mendoza. Yeah. I'm not going to blame the guy in his first. This is, he's only managed now six games as major league manager, but it seems but. like he's he's kind of squeezing the lineup card a little tight. And we talked about it last week, and you dismissed it because I was like, there's some like very small weird decisions here being made yeah. where – if there's were closer games or if things were more tight, like these would be magnified. And we saw a lot of these decisions happen in this Tiger series where the first one I text you, it made me so rationally mad because just like, it's very simple lineup management where I, I, I there was no exclamation behind it. I couldn't figure it out. So I think it was the fifth or sixth inning. It was similar to the Zach short Brett Bailey lefty situation from last Saturday. I think it where, might've even been the seventh actually. I think it was, but Joey Wendell's lineup spot comes up with a man on, he's on deck with a man on first and one out. 
and I don't remember who was up at the time, but Jeff McNeil comes out in the on deck circle for Harry, uh, for Joey Wendell to get the at bat. Which I, I Joey Wendell has a lot of faults to ball player. He's a good he's a good fielder. He's a, he seems like a good locker room guy. He actually hit the ball hard a couple of times on Thursday, but I don't think he's exactly the guy you want on the base. Uh, I mean, I play with the game online. Jeff McNeil comes out, but then I think the hitter might have been Marte. Gets out. So now instead of a man in scoring position with two outs, it's just a man at first with two outs. So then Carlos Mendoza pulls Jeff McNeil back and sends Joey Wendell out to still hit. Joey Wendell, of course, like strikes down three pitches. So then that happens. So now you say Jeff McNeil. Gary's like, okay, well, you know, you want to see, you have Jeff McNeil as your best bench hitter. You want to save him for an RBI spot. Okay, I guess that makes sense. And Joey Wendell stays out there. And then the next inning, or maybe a full time around the order. So maybe this was was the six because I had to go full time around the order because then Harrison Bader came up with a man on first and also two outs or one out later in this game. And then Jeff McNeil goes out to hit. And you're like, that was the exact same situation. And then to make matters worse, once we got to the 10th inning of this game in a 0-0 game, really tightly contested game, now you don't have your best outfield defender in the game. The guy you're only playing for outfield defense because yeah. he can't hit a lick. And then Joey Wendell second base, and Joey Wendell makes a bad error at second base on a ground ball, and Cole Keith, and winds up spurning the entire Tigers rally to wind up losing this game for the Mets. Again, you don't lose a game on one error late in the game, but it's just that kind of weird indecisiveness from the manager and we saw it more so again the game one of the double header with the tiger series yeah. it's just like these are the little things where i'm like i'd like to all these i uh, maybe i'm perfectionist that's just me for my, i want i want really good decisions all the time for my baseball coach but it's just like these little process things where i'm just like mm, that didn't feel like a, oh that didn't feel that great and i'm even watching this game was so frustrating for me because like i texted mark i was like hey i'm gonna wake up early and watch this game i have mlb tv I'm, yep. gonna, I'm not. I'm, I'm not unlocking my phone. When I wake up. My dad and I are going to sit down in the morning, and we're going to just watch this game and get ready for the day. We're going to put the game on, and I turn spoilers off on LMB TV, which is a cool feature they have. I don't remember them ever having that, so I would never not see any box score scoreboards. But the only thing you can see when you turn on a game is the time of game, and I saw two hours and fifty eight minutes. So I was like, okay, long game, probably a lot of offense. And then it's going to the third inning, the fourth inning, the fifth inning, the sixth inning. I'm like, where the fuck is the offense? How's this game? <laughs> how's this game not happening right now? And I'm like, oh, and I was going to go to the extra innings. And then once it was zero zero in extra innings, I was like, the Mets are gonna fucking lose this game because this is yeah. a long because this is a long inning in extra innings. It's not the home team working. It's just <laughs> no way. So once we get to that tenth inning, I see fucking Carson Kelly smash one to the night sky. I was like, all right, great, this is awesome. But oh uh, god, just it, it was. It, I also do my own home for a second. Sometimes I give you guys these pitcher scouting reports before these series and the previews. Sometimes I'm a little bit off. Wow. Reese Olsen, Shelby Miller, <laughs> um, Jason Foley throwing the demon yep. sinkers. That oh, he's nasty. The Tigers got some fun pitchers. And thank God these stupid Rams. We missed Tarek Skubal. Thank God. I know. We would have gotten no hit for sure. But yeah, oh, for sure. <laughs> it was a miracle. Just fun. This Tigers team is a fun little baseball team. It looks like a good shot to make a playoff run, one of my bold predictions. And um, I really don't want to play them anymore. No, no. And uh, also with the the rain outs that were going on too. Not cool that the Mets did not announce game two as a rain out way earlier. So people Bad. came and paid for parking, went into the stadium, paid for stuff, like spent all that money to then, ju- it, there was never a chance. You haven't been here. It had been raining nonstop for like 48 hours. Like there were, they were like, oh, there's a window. Window for what? Six pitches? Like, what do you think you were going to get half an inning in? Like, I couldn't believe. And the Mets have been good being proactive in the past of calling games early. So the fact that they didn't call this one against the Tigers on Tuesday early was so bizarre to me. You even saw Gary with a legendary, legendary all-time meme doing like the the crazy intro for SNY, basically like pretending as if, oh, there might be a game. And then as soon as it cuts, I don't know why that was shown, but he completely was like, oh. he did like a legendary eye roll of like basically, what the fuck are we doing here? Why are we still here? We're not playing tonight. And Gary's definitely more of like a sassy, sassy old dad, grandpa than we like kind of see on TV. So him seeing that was like, yeah, that's, that. but all this was so real. And the Mets on their, uh, on their trusty medium account actually did tweet after the game, all the little ways that if you guys were at this game or paid anything for this game, ticket parking that you can get a voucher, but you have to go on the website Ooh, and claim the voucher. So medium. everybody's using medium, I'm sure to find yeah. out that information. So on the Mets official Twitter account, I'd probably be like seven, eight tweets back because they finally were tweeting on Thursday because they actually won a game. But um, nice. if you scroll back a little bit, you find the, the 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 rain out tweet. If you were at this game and you did show up and you did pay for parking, I'm talking hopefully only like a few hundred of you that may have done that. If you go, you can get a parking voucher for another game nice. and, a tic- and a ticket voucher for another game. It's a, It has to be a Monday through Thursday and it can't be against the Yankees. It can't be against the Dodgers. So that's fine. Keep, yeah, it's fine. Keep that in mind. You get another shot to the field and you don't have to pay $40 for parking again, which is ridiculous. But 
that that Gary thing was so perfect because that was like everybody's feeling when they're like, why are they trying to play this game? Yep. Like all these people are showing up to the ballpark and there's no chance they're going to play it. But another cool thing happened during the two days of rainouts, which was we did it, Joe. Luis Severino, Zach Shore play was yes. ruled an error. <laughs> Luis Severino's ERA dropped from 10.8 to 5.4. Season we saved. Fucking did it. And you know what else happened? I had a tweet the other day that like the Mets had the sixth, I think the sixth lowest ERA in Major League Baseball after the after game one on a Monday. Of all the teams that had like the seven lowest ERAs, the Mets were 0 and 4, and every other team combined was 21 and 5. So like that, yeah. With this ERA drop, the Mets ERA dropped to lowest in the National League, third lowest in baseball. And then after Thursday, I'm sure it dropped to second or third lowest overall because they <sighs> still got really good. And it's just, yeah, it's funny. Pitching, pitching's been awesome. Pitching's been really awesome early in the season. So good. That's the frustrating part is the pitching's been so good and the offense, and especially from the guys we expect, has been so bad. Like the approach at the plate genuinely has been one of the worst I've seen. It seems like the Mets take strike one, swing at a bad pitch for strike two, and then they're, it feels like 0-2 every single time for these guys at the top of the order. Like, Nimmo has had bad at-bats. I know you said he was walking in the doubleheader today, but he's had some horrendous at-bats. Things that you're not used to seeing from Brandon Nimmo, and Lindor specifically, love Lindor, but these at-bats are like as if he hadn't played baseball in months, as if this was spring training for him. It's almost worse than that. It's almost like he hasn't played baseball before, which I don't even know how to describe that. But it's just he, he the the level of lost. Does he need contacts or something? Like I, I don't know. It looked like there was a moment in game two where he did lose a contact. He had, like <laughs> stopped the game, like told the umpire, like he was pointing to his eye, and he kept like rubbing with his glove. And I'm like, your glove, batting glove's not going to help you put your contact back in. And he wound up just striking out again, and three pitches are popping up. Like he's done every single at bat seemingly his entire year, which is fucking brutal it's like he just he just he he has to be good he's too good to be this yeah. bad he makes too much money to be this bad like he can't he can't he can't be this, this bad. bad no he isn't this bad he's not this bad it's just not true but it's also like can you just be a little better then can you just please yeah. be a little better like i don't know i just i really would like you to be a little better this team will be a lot better if you're a little better if anybody was hitting like a little bit more we would be we have significantly more wins significantly yes. I'm actually right now gonna I'm, I'm reloading up full team chase rate early in the season because I want to see if this this approach thing. Everyone's talking about this approach thing. I want to see if it's real. Okay, you and see if it's actually sticky. Oh, it's super not real. The Mets have one of the lowest chase rates in baseball. Mets chase rates just bottom bottom. It's the one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. But you know 11. what it is though. It's because they take strike one. Every every single guy is just like oh strike one right down the middle. And then they chase on strike two, and or they take strike two. Like I just feel like there is no approach. Maybe the approach isn't necessarily like broken in that like they're swinging at the wrong pitches, taking the good ones. I just think there is no approach. It feels like there is no plan at the plate for any of these guys outside of Francisco Alvarez and Brett Beatty, who have clearly had the best at bats, which feels insane to say on this team. And just clicking the the the, the double header you felt to so much for Alvarez too, where he comes up early, he gets a, he gets the first hit first center of the order. Of course, comes up second time, he gets that two out two RBI double. We're like, God damn, he's so good. And he's like, he's hit, he's eight. I think at one point during that game, he was nine for eighteen on the season. With he, that, the only person that had a higher OPS than him, I think, in baseball going into the second game of the double header was Mookie Betts. And I don't wow. know if you guys have seen how Mookie Betts has been playing, but it's as if he's not from this planet. Like he's playing possessed it's insane Mookie has been possessed there was a time yesterday where he was leading major league baseball in every single offensive category which is insane I also just like sometimes I look at I don't know I this is it's dirty talk but I'm just like damn like oh, Mookie Betts is so good like he's so, so good. good like the team is like he's like the team needs a shortstop I'll play shortstop and you know what and I'm gonna I do and be really fucking good at it I think he already has like almost three war in the season which means that he's on pace for like 20 something war <laughs> oh, like an all-time shit. season it's so like when we were saying last year that we think he would deserve the MVP, like half trying to talk shit about Ronald Cunha, but also half being like, I don't think anybody's better than this guy. It's 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 real. But also, I, I, I was doing some research on like some some Mets actually data, and they've actually been 0-1, very major league average this year. Not more than any other team. Yeah, no, exactly right. at league average. So Ugh. the data the data is not bearing out some yeah. of this approach stuff. Some of it feels that way, and I think it's a lot of a lot of what that is, just the best players on the team having very bad approaches early. But again, it's like right now we're 0-1, a league average amount. Which sucks, yeah. but it's also like, just get, just be a little better, just be a little better. And then Al- Alvarez, I think, do also got a good heat check in this doubleheader because, or at least game one of it, because he started off the game so hot, he drove in, he drove in the two runs himself early in the game, and then I think he came around the score in the Brett Beatty RBI single, yep. so he was possible in a way for all three runs. But then he had a very bad inning behind the plate with Jake Diekman, which we'll talk about again because this was another weird cross from decision that definitely deserves a little bit of attention. 
And then you also get a chance to win the game in ninth inning, just grind such a bad double play. Yeah. It wasn't like a bad double play, like you ground into a bad double play, but it's just like in that moment, just like, damn it, grind, this is the ground ball. Fuck. Yeah. I really wanted to win this game. But we also got our first taste of the Adrian Howes experience. And like also just like Sean and I, pretty good. Kind of like it. I I had a little bit of fun watching Adrian Hauser pitch. You want to why? He's got a little bit of that Bartolo two seamer. Like he I'm just saying. the guy lives on the edges, and that's a fun place to live when you throw ninety two miles an hour because you can't really get hurt too bad. And I was talking to my dad on the phone watching the game, and he's like, you know, this Hauser guy. He's like, he doesn't really leave anything over the middle of the plate. Yeah. Like he's either gonna walk you or you're gonna like hit into soft contact. And then the amount of times you saw guys pull an outside pitch to the shortstop to Lindor to Beatty you're like fuck like Adrian Hauser man it's not pretty but boy I kind of I kind of enjoy watching him pitch even Ron was like kind of gushing he was like this reminds me a lot of the guys I played with back in the days it's a little refreshing like someone who's not out there trying to throw 98 every single time he's like so unimpressive that it's impressive I stays away from everybody he doesn't miss any bad so many two seamers and sinkers and it's all on the outside and it's just like Nice. You never swearing him up. He's not. He's not blowing anything by you. He's no. not missing many bats. But it's a lot of ground balls and a lot of easy pop ups. You're like, this is nice to watch. I like this. And then you definitely don't want that experience to happen three times around the batting order, though. And that's why he did get pulled when he got pulled, which was, I think, it might have been a hair early, but also the Tigers had this spot in their batting order where it was some impressive lefties in a row with Parker Meadows one, Kerry Carpenter three, and um, and Riley Green four, which is. I know maybe to some Mets fans that doesn't exactly sound like murderer's row, but those are three. Those are three like pretty above average left-handed hitters. So like if you have multiple lefties in your bullpen, it's a good time to use them against that. So he was yanked for Brooks Raley in the sixth inning with Carpenter Riley coming up. The Tigers responded by pinch hitting, taking Carpenter out of the game. Which again, that's a win for the Mets. That's a good yeah. time bringing the lefty. Get Kerry Carpenter out of the game. He's a really good hitter for I believe it was Andy Abanez. Yes. We did I think wind up getting a hit and a run wound up scoring in this situation. But I understand Cross Mendoza and the Mets not wanting Hauser to see these guys third time. But then. That part of the lineup came up again. And now we only have a lefty one and a lefty four. And I think Mendoza got a little bit jumpy because Drew Smith the next inning got into trouble in the seventh after two quick outs to Drew Smith special. And then Jake Diekman comes in to face Parker Meadows, the first of those lefties. But Mark Hanna is sitting on the bench, and he's gotten into every game this series. And this was this was a nice comeback from Mark Hanna with Mets fans because – we were just now we can all remember him like working a nice seven pitch walk, oh, yeah. getting hit with a one two pitch right in the ass. It's like, oh yeah, Mark Hanna is a good baseball player. I remember now hitting a fly ball just to the warning track, not getting all the way out. Like this is awesome. I think Mark Hanna also might have had the fewest ever games played for a player to get a tribute video at an opposing stadium. It's close. I, he he was maybe a two hundred twenty game player as a Met. And he got like a like a forty five second tribute video before the game, which is like that's that was crazy to me. But it was also a nice thing, but. He pinch hits for Meadows and then pass ball, walk, another wild pitch. This was where Alvarez, this was kind of like the heat check, where it's like, yeah. oh, that, was, that was not, not getting behind the plate. It was also the Jake Deacon experience for Mets fans. You guys yes. got a good taste of that, where it's very uncomfortable for the, the hitter. It's very uncomfortable for Deacon. It's uncomfortable for the fielder. It's uncomfortable for the fans watching at home. It's uncomfortable for everybody because the ball leaves his hand and it's, it could be the best pitch you've ever seen, or it could be three feet above the catcher. And I, I don't know what's going to happen next, but. Deakman comes in this game and he faces zero lefties eventually. He gets out of the inning and gives up the one run. So now we're up 3-2. And then he doesn't come back in the next inning where Riley Green, the actual best hitter, the best lefty in this lineup, yeah. is in the game. Adam Adavino throws a sweeper over the middle, and Jake and Riley Green hits it to the moon. Suddenly it's 3-3. Yeah, there's no world. I mean, I, th- I thought we were past this. I thought we learned last year. I thought we learned in 2022. Adam Adavino cannot face left-handed hitters it is not something he can do and guess what if he is it's got to be a two three four run game it can't be with a chance to tie it up and especially when you had Deekman in before why is he not in to just get Riley Green out I don't understand I, I I couldn't rationalize the move at all I also felt like he came in a little bit early like we decided we like Jake Deekman against Parker Meadows more when Mark Hanna is coming in rather than Jake Diekman to get Riley Green. That one also didn't make sense to me. Maybe that's some Monday morning quarterback. A little bit of we we saw what happened and we we have a more sane take on it now because we saw the outcome. But at the same time, Parker Meadows doesn't instill the same fear that Riley Green should, even if he is an okay hitter. You meant Drew Smith against Riley. Uh, Parker well, Meadows. yes, I thought it should have yeah. been Drew Smith against yes. Parker Meadows. Drew Smith also like. I know he got into his like the classic Drew Smith two quick outs, then got into trouble. But it was like a blue pit, and he got squeezed on one of the other batters, where like he genuinely threw like four strikes in that that at bat. Didn't get a single one over uh, because of Angel Hernandez behind the plate in game one of that doubleheader. Legend back there, three blind mice, and it's all Angel Hernandez. But 
Mendoza definitely has not been sharp. And you guys know that I loved Luis Rojas. I'm always going to have Luis Rojas's back. Luis Ro- Carlos Mendoza is what all Mets fans thought Luis Rojas was when it came to making decisions. Where Luis Rojas, like at the end of the day, I really don't think was still that bad. Not the com- point of conversation. Carlos Mendoza has not really seemed to get the feel of the game just yet either. Like how the game feels, the speed the decision-making. It all seems like he's just a little bit behind, and I was really hoping this is where John Gibbons would have been able to like help out a little bit more of like, hey, dummy, no, not right now. This is not when we do this. Please, God, no. Doesn't seem like that's the case. Yeah, I'm going to have to give a little bit of these bad decisions to John Gibbons as well because it's like, ugh. And all, you've been in Major League Clubhouse. You've been a Major League Manager before, and you kind of have felt some nerves from Mendoza. A little bit. The way he's talking to the media, the way he looks at the top step. But I understand that. It's your first week as being a big league manager, and you are losing every single game ah. in in horrible, horrible fashion. So I'm not I can't like fault him for kind of feeling like a little deer in the headlights a little bit at times, but also like please be a little bit better. And then yeah, you have a major league bench coach sitting right next to you. You have a guy in Eric Chavez, Eric Chavez, who was a major league bench coach last year, standing right behind you. Those three are a little triumphant every single game where it's like can somebody can somebody do something and something we, we gave we gave Buck a lot of shit last couple of years because yes. he was a bad manager. But we he the one thing he did really well that I was impressed with is that if there was a situation where the other hitters were coming up in the eighth inning, he did not hesitate to use Edwin Diaz there. And this situation where you've burned both your lefties, it had just had to be Edwin Diaz facing Riley Green. Yeah. Unless Jake De- Deekman was coming back out. Maybe Deekman's like an up down thing, like he's not a reliever who often goes more than one inning. Yeah, maybe. I'm sure he's not. Shout out um Shout out Joe Musgrove the other day because jo, uh, Josh Hader in his entire two year stint with the Padres, he never got a four out save in the regular season. He got one in the postseason. Robert Suarez, I think, are these two, four or five out saves nice. this year. He's like, it's really nice to have a reliever who's not scared to take the ball whenever we ask him because Ooh. Josh Hader was like, I'm not doing four outs. I'm going one inning is going to be the ninth. That was like a thing. So, yeah, cool that Joe Musgrove said that. It was hilarious. Even though Musgrove <laughs> hated to get a four out save in the playoffs. So, I was yeah. going to tweet it and I looked back. I was like, oh, I actually do remember he got this big four out save against the Dodgers, the LDS. Like, I'm not going to shit on this guy for not getting four out saves when he actually did one of them mattered most but it just of, of all the machinations that happen in a baseball game to be like i want my my right-handed reliever who throws a sweeper to face riley green the only yeah. guy in this tiger's line who could really kill me because torkelson doesn't really look like him right now it was it was stupid and i, I tweeted it because like it looked like it was a pitch off a tee alex chamberlain great oh, writer yeah. fan graphs he quote tweeted he like with some good data about how often hitters pull fly balls against sweepers like up against every pitch and uh, lefties pull fly balls against right-handed sweepers like 15% of the time. Smashed every other metric on the table. It was a good tweet. And I was just like, yeah, that's exactly what happened too, huh? That's just so many machinations as bullpen. There's so many people to use. And it's just the way that jumping in the sixth, jumping in the seventh, fucks you for the eighth. It was not, it wasn't being thought out. And then the decision-making, I think, got a little bit worse. But I think this was this was the worst one. Because extra innings after a great shot inning by Jorge Lopez. The Mets are up in the bottom of the 10th. Need one run to win the game. And this is an anti-bunting podcast. We have been oh. since the beginning of time. But we've said, I guess more me, the only time in a Major League Baseball game now, the way it's currently stated, where bunting makes sense, is when you're the b- bottom of an inning, you need exactly one run to win, and you have man second base and nobody out. That's the only time the math says that the bunting makes sense. But Carlos Mendoza tried to ask Brett Bay to bunt, and it super didn't work. Yeah, the the problem I had with there again, I hate the bunt, whatever. And I I I side with the people on Twitter too, being like Brett Beatty's been one of our better hitters. Why the fuck is he bunting right now? Give him a chance to win the game. If you're gonna go with the bunt there, there is a guy on the bench by the name of Joseph Wendell who should be in and bunting in that situation because clearly Brett Beatty is not comfortable bunting. That was blatantly obvious by the awful, awful attempts he made. And you know what? I don't really care that Brett Beatty can't bunt. Doesn't bother me. Not not, not moved in the slightest. But if that was the decision that you were going to make, it has to be Joey Wendell. Why the fuck is this guy on this team if he's not going to be doing the Joey Wendell shit that you would expect him for? So that was the frustrating part for me was you had your guy to do the job that you wanted and you chose not to because you wanted Brett Beatty to bunt? That doesn't make any sense to me. Also because Mendoza wasn't really afraid to take good players out of the game because yeah. Francisco Alvarez, like we said, made the last down ninth inning. He was the ghost runner in second base and they pinch ran him for, I believe, it was Zach Short. Mm-hmm. So like if you're if you're willing to take Francisco Alvarez out of the game, that means in your head you're like, we're ending this game right now. Yes. You, should, you should be able to do the same for Brett Beatty. Or again, just let Brett Beatty hit because he's been hitting so well. Timely hits, he's been taking good at bats. Like I, again, I completely understand the bunt decision, 
in the moment after that first bot attempt was so off. So bad. And I think it was, I think this was either still Jason Foley or Shelby Miller, but just a reliever who was getting on you. It's just, it's just a bad time to bunt. It was Shelby. And it was Shelby. It was just Shelby. What a, what a name for a reliever. Jason and Shelby. But it's like the peaky fucking blind us. But, um, <laughs> It was it was just bad, and he got a lot of shit for it because there's this like there's this anti bunting constituency who I think most of them used to be the pro bunting constituency, and then it's ironic that in game two a bunt like kind of won the Mets the game <laughs> after the Brett Beatty walks, Dog Marte pushed a bunt up the first base line perfectly so well. <laughs> no, I mean, again, you guys you guys talk shit about me. Yeah, good at bunting, like, good bunting, but it was painful just that because like like the other part of me is like major league players should get that bunt down, yes. that bunt should have gotten down. Shelby Miller is a good reliever, but he doesn't throw 99. He doesn't throw 100 miles an hour. Like, the bunts should get down. Like, he'd throw in high pitches, and the bunts were missing. So that's just good pitching. It's good. Just tip your cap, good baseball. But it's just, you got to get that bunt down. But when, as a manager, you have to know, you have to put your players in position and do things good. And I will say, like, maybe, like, Brett Bailey has shown bunt to get hits a few times. He did one spring training, too. That was good. He did it a few times last year. He tried a few times this year. I wouldn't tell Brett Bailey, never try this again because, like, it's not worth it anymore. But, like, yeah. Maybe he's not even that bad at it. He just kind of flubbed in the moment. Then his manager took the heat for him. Like that might be something that happened. Maybe. Because like, the, the concept of the decision, again, anti bunting podcast, that's the one time you're supposed to bunt. That's the one time it ever makes sense. I need one run to win this game. This out does not matter. And it worked. And you know what? We bunted. It fucking worked in game two. That was our first one in the season. <laughs> so I get that. Maybe, maybe we should be a little more nice to the bunting. But isn't because yeah. then you get to the 11th inning. Tonkin comes in for another extra inning extravaganza. Bloop, bloop, bloop. Cole Keith in the gap. You have no chance. Game's over. Fucking Misery. sleeper cell. Guy's yeah. a brave sleeper cell right now. He's just nah. like, how can the Mets lose? How can I help them lose this game? Michael Tonga shouldn't be pitching with a ghost runner on second base. It shouldn't be happening. There's, we use seven relievers. Never this game. again. Like, Never <laughs> just again. Just the fact that it happened back to back games, it, that's again also malpractice. Where it's like, how did we get into this situation? Like, what was that show like on uh, Nickelodeon where like it was a rewind? Like, mm, stop. You might be wondering how I got here. It oh. should be like that every single time Michael <laughs> Tonga is in the game in extra innings. You might be wondering how I got here because I don't know how the fuck I'm here. I don't know why I'm here. Yeah, I. Uh... I, I think Michael Tonka was definitely catching a lot of heat, not his fault, but he also didn't do anything to win the game. That's also part of it. And that goes back to the conversation we had in the last episode of every other team's players step up. When are the Mets players going to step up? That's what we missed. And to be fair, in game two, despite getting no hit for, what, seven innings, we did see Pete Alonso step up in the ninth inning, hit that big home run, and then the other guys then stepped up too. Brett Beatty with the huge walk, like you said, Sterling Marte. Tyrone Taylor, who needs to be playing every single day over Harrison Bader. He has to be. He's just way better. I don't care how good Harrison Bader is in the field. Right now at the plate, he is as good as me or James if you're going up there. So you can't have that. You can't have Mark and James up at the plate right now. You're saying that, but he did break the Mets' 13 no hit, no hit innings. Oh, cool, blue. dude. Wow, yeah. sick. Nice blue Wow, color. dude. Cool, cool. Man. You play for the Mets, dude? Wow, it's great. Drop me off in Midtown, bro. <laughs> If Ed Cranepool picked them up at the airport, they'd say, Hey, dude, what's your name? Can you take me to Midtown? You played for the Mets? That's cool, man. When did you play for the Mets? That's awesome, dude. They killed Gil Hodges. Nothing's good. But I also love that. This is something that I said in the show. I said on Twitter a few times. I on Harrison Bader. Everyone's like, Harrison Bader is a starting center fielder. I was like, you guys not watch Harrison Bader hit. Correct. Watch Harrison Bader hit for two weeks. This guy's not going to have more than three to 400 play appearances because he can't. He just can't. Let me ask you this. Why in the world did they pay him $10 million? It seemed like that was the going rate at the time. But then we've seen last year. We saw, we, again, we've seen this offseason, the Mets and other teams. It seemed like the people who were proactive got boned. Yeah. And the people who waited got yeah. saved because I think it was the Pirates signed Michael Taylor for like a couple mil. Who yeah. I was saying since October is better than Harrison Bader. I would like to have him on this team. And also we see a guy like Joey Wendell who Joey Wendell seems like a great guy. Seems like a ball player. But to jump the whole market and give him $3 million guaranteed. And we got to talk about the other thing that happened in the Mills doubleheader. Julio Tehran. Yeah. I don't know why he's making $2 million. <laughs> why did they sign him for money? I don't know because then we in this game. I, you I should be paying like, the Mets to play baseball. <laughs> We talk about sleeper cell. I actually think he might be a sleeper cell, but I'll, I'll, I'll save if, that conspiracy if for he, another podcast. You know when they think he's going to make his his debut for the Mets? When? Since the fucking Braves. Yeah, Monday. I, yeah, I, know. I know. He's a sleeper cell. Because there is a rule, though, that be, who, Jose Blue got to start this game because of doubleheader, you get 27th yeah. man. But you can't call guys up who've been optioned for 10 days 
unless there's an injury that goes with it, which we're so ready for the Reed Garrett phantom injury. Like, thank you for having the game of your life, pitching three yeah. shutout innings totally. and saving us to get a win. We'll talk about him in a second because I love Reed Garrett now. But like, here's your here's your uh, reward. You're going to the minor leagues. You're going to make 40k for this next couple. Uh, you're going to 40k pay your salary for the next few weeks again. But Tehran, I don't, I don't know. I just don't know. It, it was like a weird thing where they had to get a guy because they they couldn't call up any of the minor leaguers for until next Friday. But it's also. $2 million. $2 million seemed like a lot. I would have given him 20 bucks and been like, you start, can you, can you get shelled this one game and just deal with it? Like I did look, I did look at Spo tracker because I was just like 2 million. Like he, that's the lowest salary by far for any starting pitcher in major league baseball. And like, he did have a stretch last year where he wasn't like horrible, horrible, sure. but also I just, I, I don't think he's, I don't think he's going to be good, but um, I guess we'll talk about that. What happens. I'm going to pretend Julio Tehran is not Doesn't on the exist team until he, he actually has to be on this team. Yeah. Doesn't exist until he exists. But um, I want to talk about Budo for a second because Jose Budo was put in a very difficult situation to start game two as doubleheader where the Mets are starting here in a five-game losing streak. They'd burned seven relievers in game one, and they were like, hey, you, you got to save us. You, the guy who didn't make our baseball team, please <laughs> save us right now. Uh, someone should have sent an apology letter that Tyler McGill made this team over Jose Budo because <laughs> he, he did so much after the game. Like during this game, 30 pitch first inning where he really struggled. He had no field. The fastball was running a lot. He couldn't place it, and he just didn't have any feel for the cutter or the slider, which had been his two best pitches since he developed them both towards the end of last season. And then he just got so tough, and he just did everything he could. He's like, I'm not coming out of this game. He's like, I'm throwing six innings if you have to drag me off this field. And he only gave up one run, six strikeouts, three walks, a couple hits, but only the one run, the six strikeouts. And he was literally only throwing four seamers, two seamers, and changeups. And he just kept them off balance. He stayed on the edges of the plate, low, high, uh, inside, outside, where players couldn't really hurt him. And like he, he couldn't, he couldn't, like he couldn't have any feel for the breaking ball, and he was still getting guys out. The slide and the cutter were barely used. Savant said the slider is a sweeper or and a curveball, mix of the two. I don't know, it was weird. And then that the cutter was a slider, but I think again, just knowing how those pitches were being classified in the spring, I think that's a slider and a cutter. And he really just leaned on the other stuff because he couldn't have any grip for those. He only wound up throwing two cutters, and like two of them were really nice to lefties. I think one was to um. I don't remember if it was Meadows, if it was Green, but two of them, he was just burying on the inside. So I was like, throw that pitch more. Please throw that pitch more. But it was just like, he sprinkled a few in random innings, but it was just fastball, sinker, change up, fastball, sinker, change up over and over again, which is how he got to the major leagues, which when you have no stuff, you're always going to lean on the stuff that is your stuff. So just, I just, I, I really want to see him get more chances because like he has such a good attitude on the mound. He's, he throws so many strikes, just like, it was fucking awesome to see him do this. Because if he didn't do this, if he took a 30-pitch first inning and turned that into a 60-pitch first two innings, Death. the Mets would have lost this game. Because this yeah. would have been eight innings of Johan Ramirez and and, uh, and Reed Garrett, and it would have been very bad. Yeah, I mean, to use a classic like baseball cliche here, gutsy performance from Jose Budo. I didn't get to watch it live. Your boy was out on a date. But gutsy performance by Jose Budo. Absolutely just just bulldogged it a little bit. Like you said, he didn't have the stuff, was able to get through that six and then talk about bulldog performance too. Your boy, Reed Garrett. Now is when we can salute Reed Garrett for his service. I mean, three innings, three Ks. I think he had maybe a hit, maybe a walk here and there. I don't know the exact stats, but I even got a text from my dad after the game. He was like, I know you didn't, I, you were busy. You couldn't watch this. He was like, but Reed Garrett, where'd this guy come from? 95 with the splitter. I'm like, he was here last year. He's had it all the time. He just saw it now and it worked like, but yeah, Huge, especially because the offense didn't exist for the entire game, pretty much. It's funny. I tried to say that last year, and you were like, shut up. Don't make Reed Garrett a thing. And I was You're like, right. I'm not, I still yeah. won't until no. but he showed me today. He was throwing 96. <laughs> and he used five different pitches in this game today, which I think is how a guy like Reed Whoa. Garrett gets through three innings. He was using he used a four-seamer, he used a two-seamer. He used a gyro slider, he used a sweeper, and he was dropping a splitter. And he used each of those pitches at least 15% of the time, where it's like, does, does Reed Garrett want to go back to AAA and try to start? Like, does he want to try and stretch out to 50 pitches? Like, I'd rather him start than Tulio Tehran, but... Got to performance by him. We definitely want to come up with like a segment in this show. We're trying to do more segments and stuff because we've got to be like podcasters now instead of just like have, just like showing up and, and doing a podcast. We're trying to actually be podcasters. We need a name for like the shitty hero of the week, yeah. the guy who like you didn't expect to do a good thing. Because that was more wiener of the week. Yeah, like the, it's, we wanted to make a playoff. See more stars. Yeah, we want to do a playoff like the zeal of approval because like that's what Reed Garrett was. Like the Mets do not win this game if Reed Garrett gives up no. even one run. If Reed Garrett, Reed Garrett, the guy who's a major league journeyman, has been DFA'd multiple times the last few years, if he gives up one run to a major league baseball team, the Mets lose. If we're 0-6 right now, going on the road. If the Mets were 0-6 going to Cincinnati, where they always struggle. Well, not always struggle, but it's just it's chaos baseball. We don't know what's going to happen. 
there was an outside chance to be 0-9 heading to Atlanta next week. If the Mets were 0-9 heading to Atlanta, I was never coming back to America. No. I was going to I was not gonna talk about baseball anymore. I was going to retire. So Living that thing <laughs> yeah, the Mets saved me. I was gonna just stay in Morocco. I don't know what's gonna happen. Spain, maybe I'll just find my find my home in Spain. I can blend in really well down there. My Spanish yeah. is pretty good. I could I could live down there for a couple hundred dollars a month and you would never hear me <laughs> hear from me again. Never, ever. But thank God this happened because we got to the ninth inning. And Pete hits a home run on a pitch that's almost in the dirt. He put a half swing on it. I, the ball went off his bat, and my dad and I were just like watching. We're like, oh, my God. Oh, my God. Oh, my God. Oh, my God. And I was like, fuck, yes. It seemed like the whole team was so happy. And then we talked about before the big Brett Beatty walk off the two awful calls and then Tyrone Taylor being the hero. And we just – I'm not going to say we saved the season because if, if they're still one and five. The team yeah. still looks horrifically bad. But save the moment for us at least. Save the weekend. Save April. I think I saw a tweet that there's only been three or four teams in the history of baseball that have started the year 0-5 and, and made the playoffs. So there's quite quite a hill to jump here. But new playoff system now. 15 well, of those teams have gotten to 84 wins. So I don't know. New playoff. We can playoff. do it. Mets got to rattle off 83 wins out of their next, you know, whatever amount of games. Oh, there's so many games left. But yeah, so many, it's April. It looked very cathartic the way that the Mets won this game. Like you saw Pete Alonso hit the home run. You saw the guys in the dugout, Pete running around the bases, almost like a like, ah, like, ah, I needed this. Like a lot of like yelling of like letting demons out. And then when they won the game, Pete being the goofball that he is, like chasing Tyrone Taylor down on the bases, throwing shit at him. Kind of same thing of like, ah, like they just needed to get it out. I don't know. Maybe the net Mets need to like yell before the games, like just be in the locker room and just start screaming and yelling and, and getting stuff out, but it felt like a moment where they were able to shake everything off, realize, oh shit, that's right, we are good baseball players. We're not a terrible, terrible team like we've been playing. Hopefully this is what can turn this around going into Cincinnati. I think that's probably exactly what P. Alonso sounds like when he yells too. <gasps> <laughs> but it felt good. It felt like they were happy to win a game. Of course they're happy to win a game. Carlos Mendoza said that when he got to the clubhouse after, he was greeted with beer, champagne, and eggs, which I don't know who... In the Mets club has had eggs, eggs, had eggs handy, but it's Ooh. funny. Honestly. All right, let's play a game. Who in the clubhouse, who of the Mets players would you suspect to be an eggs man? Like, just have eggs ready to go. Harrison who's, Bader. who's your pick? Harrison Bader, you think's the egg guy? Why? Just he's the protein? Egg man. Just, yeah, just has protein around. He always has a couple eggs handy. I don't know who I'd go with. Like, I, I'm, I don't know why Francisco Alvarez feels like he just pops some eggs. Like, he just, like... Like kind of like, pocket. yeah, like eggs in his pocket, eggs in his locker, like in a little Tupperware, and you just eat a hard boiled egg, like for a snack in between innings. Strong boy. I, I'm the best. First thing offer is also probably most likely in this roster to have grown up around chickens, so I think yes. that, that's probably part of it. <laughs> also, shout out Steve Gelbs because we got uh, Tyrone Taylor got the Gatorade bath after the game, and he he blew it so bad. <laughs> he was asking asking Tyrone Taylor questions, but he saw the Mets doing like the Gatorade bath from like forty yards away, like running from there all the way to the home plate where he's doing the interview, and then like. 20 seconds of silence, just like this. Mm. And then he goes, oh, I think I'm going to get out of the way. Tyrone Taylor goes, what? And he turns around and gets right back. So it's like, all right, nice. shout, out, shout, out, shout out awkward Steve Gelps there for <laughs> that one. But thank God we won this game. We still lost the series. Oh, thank God. But, like, thank God you get a win. Like, first one's the hardest to go through sometimes. Usually the Mets just do this on opening day. It's weird the Mets go this long without a win. And they, the 0-5 is the worst they've been. I think it was since 64, tied Ooh. with 2005, which was also the first year that Willie Randolph managed the team, which is kind of ironic. I was uh, Oh, that was a funny one for another ex Yankee getting his first managerial <laughs> job. But I don't know. It's it's not, it's still pretty bad, but it's not as bad as I felt in, the, in between these two games. Yeah. Between game one and game two was, again, on my way to go into my date. And I tweeted out, I was like, I don't know how the hell I'm going to watch this team for the entire year. I'm like, I have no clue because I am like dramatic. I'm in such a bad mood right now. And I know, yeah, I am being dramatic, super dramatic. But it was just like I was so perturbed by how they lost game one, SAT word of the day, perturbed, uh, that I just I couldn't handle it. I was like, if I have to watch 150 more games of them playing baseball like this, I'm going to lose my mind. I'm going to rip out the hair from my head. Like, there's no way. I can't do it. I was in like a, a bar and a restaurant with my family watching these games. I even texted you in the middle because like I lost my stream and I don't yeah. TV. I was like, I lost my stream. I could I can't watch anything right now. I'm on game day. And that's when that deep minute happened. I'm texting you like, is this anything as bad as it looks on the app? I, you were like, it's pretty bad. <laughs> but um so like my sister was a little frustrated for a little bit. I'm watching the Mets. I'm like, I, I gotta watch the team. She's like, all right, it's fine. And then she's watching it too, and the whole family's like held around my iPhone watching the Mets. And then we we just stumbled upon like a dream restaurant for me, a full gluten free restaurant in Italy, nice. and it was so fucking good. We had pasta. I was having toast and bread. I was just Ooh. going off. But it was like once this whole thing happened in the ninth and tenth inning, I got really hot. 
Like I got red. <laughs> I was like, I gotta walk outside. And I was just standing. I was standing on the street after the Mets blew this game, like in Italy, just being like, I just can't go back in. I can't go back in there. <laughs> I took a, I was wearing like two I was like a sweater and a shirt like I took the sweater off and it was like 50 degrees I was wearing a short sleeve shirt like pacing around the street I was like I can't this team is making me feel really like shit right now it's making me feel really bad I just can't I can't be in there around these people it was it was bad it was bad but again thank god they won now we have the red series coming up here go ahead and do our quick little series preview going up against the old Cincinnati Reds and they are not the Cincinnati Reds of the past this is a very good Cincinnati Reds team that will beat the Mets if they do not play good baseball four and two I believe going into the series what are our pitching matchups looking like there James Pitching matchups for the series, the Mets, I think, again, similar to missing Tyreek Skubal, are getting a bit lucky, even though this Reds rotation is, is strange right now. We're missing the ace of all aces, Frankie Montas. Friday, 6.40 p.m. game. Set your clocks for that one. Jose Quintana versus Hunter Green. You guys have heard me wax poetic about Hunter Green in the show before. He's like he's like if Spencer Strider didn't have a publicist and had a much worse home park and a much worse <laughs> team behind him because he's throwing 100-mile-an-hour fastballs, breaking off sliders, new splitter, new curveball. He's, he's a very good pitcher. He's a good pitcher more so, again, but like – in theory, than on the field right now because the things he does are disgusting, but he's found ways to always get hit. And then Saturday, I'm doing math right now. Okay, so this is a 410 game on the six-hour time difference in my ESPN and my internet. I'm doing this podcast in the morning. Mark's doing it in the middle of the night, which yep. is fun, fun wrinkle for the show. 3 a.m. Yeah, for me, 923. <laughs> Luis, Severino, Luis Severino versus Nick Martinez. Nick Martinez, could old Padre, converted reliever to a starter. He looks, he's been fine. You could definitely hit him, especially in Cincinnati. And then Sunday... Sean Maniah versus Andrew Abbott. Andrew Abbott burst ace on the scene last year. Uh, Andrew Abbott is not an ace. He's not even close. I think I think the Mets could really rip rip Martinez and Abbott off. This this is we've seen this in the past with the Mets. You go to Cincinnati. This is where cold bats go to get hot. This is where hot pitching goes to get cold. And I feel like, the, especially going to Atlanta after, I'm scared. This is exactly what's going to happen to this Mets team. It's, we're going to be able to just miss time everything. But yeah, I'll take that just for the offense to come around. And I, I talk shit about the schedule a lot. Cincinnati Reds are coming off a series where they beat the Phillies. I uh, talk about the ace off Frankie Montes for Zach Wheeler a couple nights ago. I watched that two o'clock in the morning in Italy because I'm a sick freak. Frankie Montes goes toe toe Zach Wheeler and beats him. I got flamed by Mets fans for saying I wanted yep. Zach, Frankie Montes in this team. I said Frankie Montes by a lot over Lucas Giolito. People said I was an idiot. People didn't people didn't see the vision. Not true because they're awesome. But the Reds to start the season: Nationals, Phillies, Mets. Why are the Reds? Home and away, just playing NL East teams to start the season. Oh, no, I, no clue. Who, whoever the seventy-five-year-old couple is, it makes Major League Baseball schedule. No, they don't do it anymore. No, no, I'm making, I'm making the uh, joke. Yeah, uh, they bring them back because whatever computer program is making the schedule fucking sucks. The Mets yeah. are all also the Mets are in three three series in a row. Central teams. Wow, mm-hmm. why is this? And then five out of our six, first six series, just with the Braves sprinkled in. Central teams, stupid as hell, but. This Reds team is fun. I want you to talk about some of the hitters right now, and it, it's it's just going to be bad box baseball on Cincy. Yeah, you got uh, Ellie De La Cruz. He's obviously the most exciting player, I think, on this team. He hasn't been particularly playing well to start the year, but he Not just like. has the ability to put up four home runs in this series like it's absolutely nothing. He does struggle from the right-hand side. He's a switch hitter, does not see lefties well. He might not even necessarily play when Quintana's on the mound or Manaya necessarily. Uh, he had didn't play last year when the Mets had lefties on the mound, so something to keep an eye out for. Jonathan India could be a trade piece at some point by the Cincinnati Reds. He's playing some good baseball. And then you have Spencer Steer, who's a good hitter. Christian Encarnacion Strand is a young rookie who's got some crazy power. Not playing well. Good power, though. Will Benson, Jake Fraley, Nick Martini. Get used to hearing those names because none of them are particularly good, but they're all going to be really annoying and they're going to play well. I'll say this. I, um, I'll, I agree with you on Martini, but Benson and Fraley are Major League Baseball players. Like no, They're no. the kind of player that you'll never respect, but I love. Correct. The, they, are, they exist in a vacuum of they work perfectly in Cincinnati because they can hit the ball soft and get home runs, but you put them on the 29 other teams in Major League Baseball and they probably don't start. Again, Will Benson, I think will, because Will, will Benson has done something where the Cleveland Guardians are becoming the new St. Louis Cardinals, where if an outfielder True leaves what? their organization, they become superstars. And I'm being I'm being hyperbolic. Will Benson's not a superstar, but his only problem, because he's like a big physical dude. He was a high draft pick, Huge major dude. power, major physical tools, fast. He, oh, his whole thing was just, I'm swinging at every single pitch. And now he doesn't do that anymore. He stopped chasing as much, and he makes crazy contact still. He's awesome. He's, he's a good baseball player. He's going to hit a home run the series, book it, guarantee it. But... This Reds team, they just they throw, they throw a lot of shit at the wall hitting because they know they can, and then the pitching is kind of like what they can get out of it. Fernando Cruz has had a really good year to open the, bull, the bullpen, open season the bullpen for the Reds. Alexis Diaz has struggled a bit out of the gate. This bullpen is 
it's it's easy, very gettable. The starting rotation is yes. very gettable. What they have right now, and it's just like let's. If you guys score six runs, probably the winning game Cincinnati though. So I think I think this Mets offense, if they're actually if Francisco Lindor plays well, can actually do that. And it's just I would like them to do that. Yeah, it would be really really nice to just see some home runs from guys not named Pete Alonso. That would be fun. Yeah, and I think that that's good for the Reds preview. But we told you guys now. We'll, one day, one day a week, we're going to give you guys a shit take of the week. And we had a few for this episode, but we're going to save them, I think, because briefly we want to do some prospect stuff. Just want to talk about Christian Scott. He made his debut for AAA Syracuse yesterday and was fucking disgusting. He had 19 swings and misses in only four innings with nine strike guys. He gave three earned runs. He got hit up a little bit. Got some, uh, got some hard contact against him. But amazing fastballs up in the zone. Great sliders and sweepers. Look, look down. He was really burying his... Again, I'm a sicko. I was up at 2 o'clock in the morning watching Christian Scott pitch in Italy on the <laughs> MILB TV app. He was really doing a good job. This is the Yankees AAA team, Scram Wilkes-Barre. Doing a really good job against lefties, burying that like little tight slider he has like, on the hands to lefties while dropping the sweepers on their feet and doing all that on the outside to a right-handed batter. So good outing for Christian Scott. Gave up some runs, but I think this is a situation where some of the most pitches in minor leagues, results matter far less than what you're doing with pitches. And he was doing 45% fastballs, 30% gyros, and like 15% sweepers and changeups. So working on that sweeper, make sure he could throw that, working on that changeup, make sure he could throw that pitch to lefties and just like kind of just inundating minor league hitters with velocity. Cause like we have, we talked about in the show, if you throw 95 yeah. in AAA, like you're going to murder AAA hitters. And then the Yankees did make some good contact. Again, had some good hard contact, but got swings and misses using all four pitches. Good stuff. And also, yeah. as we're starting that year in Syracuse, so ironic because how bad this Mets team is hitting. Luis Angel Cunha and Drew Gilbert, first week of the season, really bad. Not doing anything. Both <laughs> striking out, no power from either of them. Mark Vientos is carrying that Syracuse lineup right now, so it's actually Classic. a good start to the season. But that's where we're at. And, uh, and Jose Iglesias, of course, taking the, taking the strong spring the up to the, great, to the great white north. Yeah, no, uh, with Christian Scott, too, I, there's been a little bit of buzz, especially from the SNY booth, of like, Maybe Christian Scott should be getting a look here when we have these pitchers going down like Tyler McGill. Like, is this the Christian Scott time? Every start that he has that continues to look good is one more start closer to him coming up to the major league level. And it seems like we will be seeing him in no time as long as he continues. And again, pitching this Mets team right now is not the problem. Not the problem. Right? Next time we talk to you guys, it might be the problem. It could right be. Now, right now, April 5th, it is not the problem. So we can hang our hats on that. Wait, also, uh, the McGill family, tough weekend. Did you see what happened to Trevor? No. Oh, my God. So Tyler McGill obviously didn't pitch well, got hurt, shoulder MRI, whatever was going on with him, shoulder inflammation. Trevor got food poisoning one of the days in New York City, went back to Milwaukee after feeling terrible from the food poisoning, went to a phone store, passed out in the phone store, hit his head, concussion, IL. Tough weekend for the McGills. Shut up. I've, this, the six hour time difference, I'm missing so much good baseball yeah. news. Can I just wake he, up and try to grab it? And it's like, not there. All six foot eight of them. He could have gotten seriously, seriously hurt. The guy's in a store and passes out because he was so weak from the food poisoning in New York. That's funny. I, I had a funny pass out story with my life one time. Not me, but one of my friends, shut up, Ray, in uh, college. She, we just like become friends. And we're like, it was like Sunday hungover, like go to Chipotle. And um, it was like one of the first times we ever like hung out and like got food like in a group of people, and she just passed out in the middle of Chipotle. Nice, like just crumpled. I was like, "Oh my god, what's going on? What's going on? What's going on?" And she, two <laughs> seconds later, I just woke up. She's like, "Oh my god, just dehydration." But yeah, passing out, scary, scary thing. I hope yeah, Trevor's I did okay. It, uh, did it back in January when I was getting my infusion for Crohn's disease. <laughs> I decided, you know, it would be a good idea to not eat food or drink anything until four o'clock when I'm getting my infusion. The guy puts in the needle to my arm or the IV to my arm, missed my vein, told me I missed. I could feel that he missed. And I went, ooh, don't feel great. And then apparently I just put my head down, passed out. And then he shook me and I woke up like, what have you? He's like, you passed out. I was like, oh, I'm sweaty. I'm so <laughs> warm right now. Like, this terrible, bad feeling. No fun. Passing out's not fun. Shout out to the McGill family. Trevor couldn't have passed out. Game one of that series, though. Definitely not. Of course not. No. I couldn't have passed out on the off day there. But <laughs> all right. No worries. Uh, good episode. Good episode. Good episode, guys. Thank you so much for listening. Thank you so much for watching. Remember to follow us on all our social media, at MetsUp. We just put out our first piece of content in my life that's got a million views. Super proud of it. The Robin Ventura rain delay TikTok got 1.1 million views in like 48 hours, which is just fucking stupid. It is dumb that it got that many. But hey, shout out you guys. We appreciate it. We're almost up to like 5,500 followers on Instagram. Can't figure out for the life of me how to get people to watch on TikTok. But boy, oh boy, do the boys know how to cook on Instagram. So make sure you're following us on all the social media there. Mets up. If you want to see the YouTube version of what we're talking about here, Mets Up Podcast, go search it up on YouTube. You'll be able to find us there. And if you're listening to us, Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Google Odyssey, drop us a rating, drop us a review. We have some shout outs here. I actually know 
We have a couple reviews in, so I'm going to read them right now. Nice. Hopefully you've made it this far Good to the call. end of the episode. But we do have a couple new reviews coming in. First one from Augustus Octavius. I mean, that's nice. insane. That's name, awesome. But I As I'm in Italy. It. Yes, he says, love these guys. Perfect balance of new baseball with the stats, development, analytics mixed with the old school baseball with the vibes, jinxes, dogging him. I'm in my mid-30s, so I learn a lot of new phrases from these guys too. Disgusting. This kid might be a guy, et cetera. Keep it up, guys. This is my go-to new go-to Met show and shameless plug since this might be read on the show. Shout out to a book I'm getting published called How to Start a War if you're into World War II stuff. Got to grind. Yeah. You guys inspire me. So shout out, Augustus. We do appreciate you leaving that review. And then we got one more Don't from the, name. the weather penis thing. Um, <laughs> two years ago, my doorman. This feels. Is this Ernie, by the way? It might be Ernie. Okay, it might be Ernie. Two years ago, my doorman, who was a fellow Mets fan, suggested I watch Giraffe Neck Mark on YouTube. I thought the name was kind of cringe, so never did. Fast forward, and I've been listening to every episode of Mets stuff and really enjoying. I don't know until three. I don't know until three episodes in that this was the same Mark. Prejudice equals squashed. Great pod, LFGM. That's what makes me think it's not Ernie. Is there? Yeah, it's like, not Ernie. It might be the same building though. Yeah, the Weathercock. That's quite the name. You know who you are. Appreciate you for leaving that review. Shout out that doorman. We got to get that doorman of a care package or something because he's yeah, helping us. Something. Definitely yeah. for sure. But uh, guys, thank you so much for listening. Thank you for watching. And uh, we'll catch you on the next episode. Peace out. Peace out. See you guys next time.